Lawrence, no, it's Lorenzo, Bruno, Nero, Delalio. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to think, we're in the midst of the Six Nations madness, and I was trying to think of when we actually met up, when we, we played against each other for the first time. Can you remember that? Um, well, it was... It certainly wasn't. Uh, it was sort of around about the day when Betamax video was still in force. I think <laughs> would, have, would have been a long time ago. I mean, you first came to uh, you first came to England in when? I think we played. I think you were on the bench of an under twenties team or an under twenty yeah. ones team. Would yeah. that be right up in Newcastle? Would it, the coldest day yep. of my rugby career actually mm. it was one of the first. And but I can't believe it. You were on the bench. Well, I think it was England Day actually. I was. I might have been on the bench for. Um, uh, it was in Gateshead, yeah. And uh, you were obviously playing in the team. Yeah. Um, and I'd, I'm not sure I even got on the field, which I was probably quite grateful for. No, I don't know. I think you won on, on that, that occasion. But I, you came to look rugby relatively late. Yeah, I think. I mean, I, I I played a lot of rugby throughout my childhood, as you know, I'm sure you did, and but all sports and. I went to a, a Catholic school in in, uh, in England, which was all about rugby. Uh, played a huge amount of seven aside in the early days, uh, and my, you know, it was quite hard to break through in in the fifteen man game because, you know, it, it, it was a bit of an old school shop. You know, unless you uh, unless you were a certain age, you didn't get in the team, and you know, and people held on. So, uh, you know, nowadays you see young guys breaking through brilliantly. You know, straight onto the international scene. You know, as we know, it took a long time to get there for us, but. Uh, I, I joined WASP when I was 18, uh, in 1990, um, and uh, I didn't make my first team debut until for until about until I was 22. Uh, but the minute I made my first team debut, I think I made my England debut the following uh, the following month. So things happened quite quickly for me, and uh, but really enjoyed it. You know, it's been it's been a phenomenal uh, journey. Did I read somewhere that were you in a choir in school? <laughs> I was in a choir. Uh, I think I was there for team morale. Were rather. you there? But you were in a successful choir. Yeah, no, it was a very good choir. I mean, singing, as we know in Ireland, is something that everyone's passionate about, and uh, and so was I. Maybe it's the uh, maybe it's in the blood. But I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed being part of a team. Um, we were singing in things like Evita on the West End stage. We sang with Tina Turner. We did lots of different um, tours, which were. Probably slightly different to rugby tours, but uh, it was a great thing to be part of. Uh, don't get me wrong, I wasn't a soloist. I wasn't necessarily uh, one of the lead singers, but uh, I had a deep voice at the age of 13. I think that helped. Were you like a giant among the rest of the crew at 13? <laughs> no, I wasn't, funnily enough. Um, I don't know where you know about yourself, but I kind of shot up around about 15, 16. Uh, up until then, uh, I was a relatively uh, average-sized person um, in rugby as you know, it doesn't start getting interesting and, and exciting until you get a bit bigger. But uh, nowadays, young kids are a lot bigger and much earlier. You know, they've either been in the gym or they you know, they understand about rugby. I mean, I, I was, you know, barely uh, 90, 90 kilos when I left school. Did you, and did you play first team in school in Ampleford? Uh, I did. For, I played in the first seven, the, the seven aside team. I didn't make the 15 aside team because it, it had a fantastic side. And um, as I said, I was a bit of a late developer, but uh, I... Uh, I really enjoyed my rugby up there. We had a we had a coach there called John Wilcox who played fullback for England in the 60s, 63. Um, and he was a real disciplinarian and worked the team really hard, made sure they got really fit. And we had an outstanding side. You know, we, we went unbeaten for maybe two, three years, much the same as some of the great, you know, schools here in Ireland, both in, in Limerick and places like Black Rock as well. Well, I actually was very similar. I was small, mm. scrum half, out half when I started. Gave it up for a couple of years because... Yeah. Actually, I wasn't big enough for it, yeah. and it was, um, yeah. I, I only got into it at the very end, and yeah. in, in, at the end of of um, a first year, I played senior cup with Munchens, mm. but I had no real dreams of actually being yeah. a rugby player. Did, did yeah. you? Was it kind of no. part of your future? No, at and that stage? I mean, I played on the wing. You know, which um, if you're if you play in North Yorkshire, it's freezing. No one gives you the ball. Um, you know, there wasn't as much kicking in those days, and. You could go, you know, forty minutes without touching the ball, which uh, doesn't make it particularly much fun. Um, and as it, you know, there was no kind of career uh, to speak of in rugby. It looked like good fun; the guys seemed to enjoy it. But you, you know, you weren't thinking at a young age, "Well, oh, when I grow up, I want to be a rugby player." So you kind of just stumbled into it, really, and, and very much enjoyed it. But it wasn't on my radar to, to do something I would end up doing on a full time basis. And. Um when you finally got it, when you joined Wasps, mm. when you suddenly got your start, 
it did go ballistic very quickly, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, it did. I mean, probably the you know we were trailblazers in a way. You know, I'd I'd watched rugby on TV, on the radio, listened to it on the radio, watched the Five Nations as it was then, and sort of got it got excited about it. Um, you know, I, I went through a difficult time when I was young. I lost my sister when I was 16. I was sort of wandering, drifting a little bit. And then I, rugby started to become more and more influential in my life. I needed some sort of uh, stability, something to give me a bit more structure. Um, I remembered that I wanted to join a rugby club. I literally picked up the newspaper. I opened the paper and Wasps happened to be at the top of the table in, in England at that time in 1989, 1990. Uh, I could have joined any number of clubs, but I thought, well, I'll go there. Uh, it was in London. I thought it can't be that far away. And I walked in there and it, it had a real kind of working man's club feel about it. I really enjoyed the environment. No one knew me. No one asked me any questions about what had happened to me. They just accepted you for who you were. And that's what kind of appealed. And, and uh, you know, little did I know that five years later, you know, the game would, would, would turn professional. You know, I was just enjoying being somewhere that put a smile on my face. Uh, my parents used to come and watch me play, as all of our parents did. They supported us through everything, and it put a smile on their face, and and that was kind of it, really. And and uh, I enjoyed the uh, the spirit not only within Wasp, but when you played other teams like like yours at Harlequins and and other sides. That it was just a great great rivalry, great spirit, great feeling. I, I know your father was Italian. Your mm. mother Eileen, you described as your rock, yep. um, was very Irish. Mm. Um, did you ever think of donning a green jersey? Uh, many times, actually. I mean, I thought about um, once you play, establish yourself in club rugby um, and then you start to sort of have thoughts and maybe feelings and dreams of playing at the highest level, you know, you, and then when you see other guys do that, you think, actually, this is really what I want to do. I want to play for my country. Um, when I say my country... I was a bit confused, really, because <laughs> I was born in England. Uh, my mum was raised in Ireland, but moved to England. My father was born in Italy, raised in Italy, but moved to England. So um, I guess the first thing I was thinking of was England. And I'll be honest with you about that, because that's where I was born and brought up. Uh, but the first team to approach me were Italy. Uh, ironically, I played for England against Italy in a junior match. And they phoned me up and they said, what do you, you know, with a name like Delalio, what are you doing playing for England? This is wrong. <laughs> and they had a point. Yeah. <laughs> and so they, they threw a lot of things at me and said, look, this is, this is some, we've got the next 25 years mapped out for you. You know, how do you, what do you think? And my, my father got very excited. I didn't quite get as excited. Um, so I, I parked that for a while. The next phone call, um, thankfully came from Ireland. I was really finding it hard to break into the England team. It was a bit of a, a closed shop. And Ireland, uh, Noel Murphy, the chairman of Ireland Selectors, a man you know very well um, from Cork Con, um, threw the charm down and, and tried to persuade me to, uh, to to wear the green shirt of Ireland uh, by convincing me that I, you know, liked a few pints of the black stuff and that it would be a good idea. <laughs> and he said to me, "I'd hate to see, I won't do the Cork accent, but he said I'd hate to see you wear the uh, the white shirt of England and sit on the bench when he said you could be running out in Dublin wearing the green shirt of Ireland." And um, he was a very charming man through all the blarney on me uh, and I did think about it very very seriously uh, I didn't have too long to think about it because out of the blue came a phone call about three weeks later from the head coach of England and they said look we'd like, we've, we've watched you play it's about time we took you away on tour and I went off to South Africa uh, and I've, and the rest as they say Keith is, is history. history but uh, absolutely no problem you know, had I um, had I taken that opportunity to play for either Italy or Ireland I'm sure I would have never looked back because Bit like yourself. Once you once you're in, you know you're all in, and that's it. And you don't you don't change your mind. Did your mum put you under pressure? <laughs> she she wanted me to play international rugby. So uh, she was she, she you know you know what your parents are like. They want you to they want to do the best for you. And uh, she uh, she yeah she was she she passed me the phone and said look go on speak to this guy. He sounds very charming. So uh, yeah, but she was happy with the decision I made in the end. And we're in the midst of the Six Nations mm. and, you know, we grew up in the Five Nations mm. and that was part of it. We played a fair amount of it. Um, you were in your pump for an awful lot of that time. Uh, do you look on back on that very, very fondly or do you feel you left some things behind? Um, I think you always look back at your career and think to yourself, I mean, I, I'm very proud of what I achieved, what we achieved, because uh, it's, you know, both I and we, but more we, because... It is about the team. It's about the. I only played really for two or three, well, three or four teams, and and uh, 
and each one of them was very special, whether it was your club, I, I played for one club, WASP, for 20 years, whether it was for um, you know, your, your country, um, England in this case, which played for 13 years, um, and the British Lions, where I managed to go on three tours. So, no, no, I feel very proud of what we all achieved as a group. Um, I don't think I can look back and say, you know, that I, I left too much out there. There's one or two things I would have done differently, you know. I, I went through my career, um, there's games I lost that I, I could have been, a, I'd shown a bit more humility. There's games I won where I could have shown a bit more grace, but um, I certainly gave everything and uh, I feel that I ended up in, in, in credit. And look, you know, we all have our setbacks throughout our careers, whether it's off the field, on the field, you know, injuries, etc. I, I had my fair share like most, but uh, I really, you know, feel very proud to have been able to span both eras the amateur era for six years you know like yourself and the professional era for 13 and uh, and also had a lot of fun as well you know it, it was about winning of course it was about winning uh, and it was about you know giving your best but it was also about um, having a bit of fun too do you get to meet up all the guys that you played with from the lions tours from england from wasps yeah i think you do um you know thankfully not all the time because you know, rugby was a big part of your life and, and, you, and things move on. You have family, friends and other people that you need to spend time with. But there, there, there is a special and unique bond amongst players that you played with, of course, but also that you played against. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's great to bump into people. Rugby is still a huge part of my life. I'm involved in, you know, maybe not as, as deeply as possibly others were, like coaching is, is I haven't, I've not really dipped myself into that because... It's at the moment. It's just felt like a step too far. You know, I felt like I didn't. I gave it everything to the game, and so. Uh, but I'm still involved in the game on, on in broadcasting in the media. Uh, I'm on the board of the club. Was I played for for 20 years, and I think through all of that, uh, my charity Rugby Works works with young kids through rugby, and it keeps me very much involved with and seeing lots of people that I played with and against, and it, and it's great to to find out what they're all up to. You, you mentioned um, soon after you retired that mm. you thought you would come into coaching. Mm. When did that change? Well, I just think that, um, like yourself, I would imagine I felt that I gave everything I could to the game of rugby when I played. And um, and that took its toll both on me and on everyone around me. You know, there's a lot of collateral damage when you, I mean, it's a very selfish career playing at the highest level for 20 years, you know, it's all about you. And everyone else has to put you first, you have to put you first. and. I think at the end of it, I was just exhausted by doing that. And uh, it was about not putting me first. And I think if I went into coaching, uh, which I was very tempted to do in the early stages, uh, you know, it, I'd have to have that relentless kind of thing about winning again, which I, I you know, which I think, <laughs> I'm not sure it would be very good for me straight away. You know, I just wanted to take time. And I'm very comfortable with that decision. It might be something that... Um, I move back towards. Uh, I'm not flippant enough to think I can just walk into any job. Of course, you have to earn your stripes like anything else. But uh, it just didn't feel right for me at the time. And the involvement I have with the game now, you know, yes, it's comfortable. It's not as um, risky and cutthroat as coaching. But you know, I've done that for enough. To, you know, I've done that for 20 years. Yeah, I, f I found when when I went to retire, I was never going to coach. Yeah, I kind of knew it straight away. Yeah. And it does. It is incredibly obsessive. Yeah. And you think about playing every second of every day mm. and it takes over a huge amount of your life. And I actually wanted to draw a line that I thought I might come back to it yeah. afterwards. I like coaching the kids yeah. every now and then, but I don't want to even be the head coach of the mm. kids. I want to kind of pop in, do a session, maybe try and give them that sense of yeah. enthusiasm and discipline, the kind of mixture of the two that I, that I would have loved. Yeah. But I couldn't get my head around that on stopping. And I, like I retired at 31 and... I retired from all rugby. Now, my body was pretty broken at that stage and I thought I wanted to stop. You retired twice from international rugby. Can I ask why you retired the first time and then what brought you back? Uh, well, I think in the, you know, everyone talks about England in 2003 and it was a wonderful uh, journey. Well, it finished as a wonderful journey, but there was a huge amount, as you'd appreciate, sacrifice that went into that. And I felt that for about five or six years, from 2001, um, sorry, from 1999, right the way through to 2003, um, the the rugby treadmill for me was relentless. You know, I was involved in a very successful club, Wasps, that was playing right the way up to the end of the domestic season in May. I'd have like a one day off, and then I'd get on a plane and go on an international tour. Then I'd come back and I'd have a week off, and then go back to the start of the season, and that just went on and on and on for about three or four years, and. 
I lived away from home more than I lived at home. Um, you know, literally, physically. Um, you know, I had young kids at the time, didn't see them, didn't see my wife. And as soon as 2003 finished, it was a great celebration, great time for English rugby. A lot of guys retired, but I didn't. I, I had a week off and I went back to my day job and I, and I was on, on, on that treadmill again. And then that took me all the way through to 2004. Um, great year, we won the European Cup for the first time with Wasps. We won the, the title with Wasps and then I was on another plane again, going off to New Zealand and off to Australia. And I thought, well, this is enough is enough. You know, someone should be sending me to the Caribbean or, you know, I deserve a rest now, you yeah. know, but, and if you don't step off that treadmill yourself, no one, no one, or you don't get injured, no one takes you away from it. And I just thought, I, you know, I, I was having some difficulties with, with my wife, quite understandably, because I'd hardly seen her for the, you know, she's like, you know, what are you doing? You know, you, and surely you, you won the World Cup, enough's enough, you know, just got to stop. Of course, you don't want to stop playing international rugby, but someone needs to build in a bit of rest. So, uh, so I just decided that, right, I'm going to, I'm going to retire. Um, I probably knew in my own mind that I was, it wasn't going to be permanent, but I just needed to take a break. And I did. Uh, but of course, what you find is once you do take a break, it's not quite that easy to step back in because uh, the game moves on very quickly. Other players come and take your place and, uh, and the landscape changes. But uh, I, uh, I came back in for the, um, for the season just before the Lions went off to New Zealand and, uh, and then I went off to New Zealand and broke my leg in the first 10 minutes of the game. So, uh, yeah, it's amazing how things turn out. Are you glad you went back in? Mm. Did you have more perspective going back in? Were you as obsessed when you were back in? Well, it's a very different side. You know, I, I grew up with a, with a certain generation of players. Uh, and, um, you know, that culmination of that group probably was 2003. Um, and then suddenly that group's gone. And then by the time I stepped away and then step back again it's probably a completely different landscape or you know the new coaches new players and you kind of felt that you know not that the game had moved on but it was changing different differently you know we were doing things differently and and I, I guess you become the sort of elder statesman of the team um, I had to sort of um, understand what it felt like to sort of be part of a squad rather than be part of a team if that makes sense um, I was uh, I spent a lot more time on the bench, which was no bad thing. You know, yeah. you come off the bench and and you work out that role and and how to influence the game in the last twenty minutes as opposed to the first twenty minutes. Was that good for the ego or bad for the ego? Uh, I think it just takes a bit of getting used to. I I I played fifty games for England till I, I got dropped on my fiftieth game. So um, it, it made me understand what it must be like to come into a Formula One race, sort of thirty five laps in. Uh, it's quite difficult, but yeah. makes you appreciate the role of everyone within the squad. Now I'd say, you know, the way the, the dynamics of a team work, that everyone is kind of a starter or a finisher or, you know, everyone's involved as a, in the team. You know, then... It, it has changed very heavily. Yeah. There was definitely a starting team and then the other guys, you know, but I think it's, it's very much all one now. Would you like to be playing now? Not at your age, obviously. But yeah, yeah, I, I, I'd love to be playing all the time, really, um, because it's it's you know if you're young and you're fit and uh, and you have everything going for you, then it's it's the greatest game in the world, definitely. Um, so yeah, if, I'd love to be playing, but I'd like to be 24 and playing, yeah, not 34 and playing. Yeah, um, it uh, has yeah. become a young man's game. Huge, very yeah. very aggressive, yeah. very attritional on the yeah. players. And the best rugby, you know, I mean. The best time you have in rugby is in those in those early years. You don't realise it at the time, but it's just fantastic because you're not thinking about the pressure of the game. You, you 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 understand the adrenaline. You feel the adrenaline. You understand the importance of each game, but you just don't have any pressure at all, and you just go out and play. And so yeah, I would love to be playing now, but I, I'm not craving playing because um, I I I had a you know I didn't leave the game early because of injury. I didn't feel like there was things that I hadn't or should have or could have won that I didn't win um, so I, I don't feel like I've I've got anything that I need to fulfil um, I'm as excited for the players now when I watch them and see them win and celebrate and and, uh, and even lose as I've as I was when I played because I know all of those emotions like you do all of those feelings of despair when you lose what it feels like to be beaten with a kick in the last minute of the game or someone scores a try and it takes it takes the feeling away from you and equally you remember all of those feelings of winning whether that be with your club your province your um, your country the lions all of that so I, I like to see other people have those feelings because i remember exactly what they feel like myself and they should they shouldn't be uh, 
just for just for one or two of us they should be for everyone yeah if if you look on on that a you getting injured and you lots of injuries coming back and play we're 20 years in now to professional rugby yeah. have we learned our lessons and are we protecting our players enough at the moment um that's a it's a it's an open question because uh if you speak to lots of different people you'll probably get lots of different answers um if you're you know young and you want to have a long and, and fruitful career then you do need looking after you know if you're slightly older and longer in the tooth you want to play every single game that, 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 that that's left because you recognize that you've only got two or three more years left in the game so i think there is a duty of care that we have to look after players but we also have to remember the nature of the sport that we've created that, that, that rugby is and um you know it's gladiatorial it's a battle um you know there will be injuries there will be um uh you know there, there will be people that um that that suffer that there will be short careers there'll be those that last a bit longer you know that's just the way that's the nature of the beast and and i think that what i don't want is this is the is the game to change beyond all recognition no i for me i think there needs to be a few changes i still yeah. we still need to get away from any contact above the shoulders yeah. because of the fears around concussion and uh, all the potential damage that that could do in latter years that we don't quite know yet but we see in other sports mm. and I, I you know i would like to tidy elements of that up a bit um uh, i'm i'm i asked a question because from an irish perspective we would look at one of the elements that we can uh, look after our players yep. and have the duty of care that uh, that's mentioned a lot but not really delivered mm. on a lot is that we can maneuver our players around a little bit save them for some of the bigger matches um not have to play every yeah. single week so when the irish players came back off the lions tour they didn't play for five or six weeks in the season mm. whereas the english players are in on the first week of the season so yeah. uh, have we got it right or are is the english premiership been more commercial maybe yeah, i think um it's well the english premiership like to f flex their muscles and remind the rfu that they are the ones that, are, that own the players that have the you know the, the 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 contracts with the players so maybe maybe that was part of it but i think that that has to be a bit short sighted yeah, really, yeah, when you're is. just coming back from, yeah, from a tour listen, three listen, or four it's weeks it's about later. getting the best out of the players you have and and but you know knowing and seeing the schedule that they had the previous season and then going into the Lions tour you know if you want them still to be playing you know in six months time for you as a club then you don't want to break them straight away but but also the one the, the, the people that we forget in all this is the players themselves you know players as you get a bit older and a bit brighter and a bit sort of braver you know you sit down with with your with, with whoever's in charge of you and say look this is what I'd like, you know, I'd like to play or I don't want to play or I think I'm in good shape to play or I'm not in good shape to play. And I think if you if you rush people back from from the Lions and, and make them play straight away, you then have to recognise that they need rest built in further down the line. If you rest them immediately, then they need to play a bit further down the line. So I don't think there's anything that either side have done right or wrong. The Irish are, are, are getting the benefits of resting their players because the only really competitive matches they've played in have been one or two of the more high-profile top 14, um, sorry, uh, Pro, yeah, 14, Pro 14 yeah. games and all of the Champions Cup. And I think that's probably why we've seen a, a significant shift in, in, in Ireland's players playing in, in, you know, so well in that competition. But, you know, a couple of years ago, in between Lions tours, you know, the Irish guys weren't going so well. And, yeah. uh, and, and you know, the English clubs were flying. So I, I just think, you know, if you, I'm very happy to play as many games as anyone wants, but at some point you have to build that rest in. Uh, otherwise, you'll get more players either getting injured or stepping off the treadmill and just retiring early or whatever it might be. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's horses for courses. But at the moment, uh, there's, there's definitely a feeling in England that, the, uh, that we're, not, we're pushing the players to the limit and we're not looking after them in the same way as they are looked after in Ireland or, or in Wales or in some of the other places. Which brings us, I think, back around to this Six Nations mm. and the fact that um, there's 58 players injured mm -hmm. before the Six Nations start between the countries, which seems a little bit ludicrous. It does. Uh, and maybe is that a reflection of the amount of rugby that all of those countries have played or those, those teams have played? Um, is, 
you know, the worry for me as well is that uh, the tournament now, the Six Nations, is played in such a short, condensed period of time. It's it's over seven weeks, eight weeks, seven weeks. Seven weeks. So, you know, that's five games in seven weeks. Not just five games, five international hard Test matches against you know big and strong players. So the injury list ain't going to get any smaller. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so the strength of each of those squads will be tested to the, to, to the limit. I mean, I remember coming here into Dublin in 2003. Uh, it was our final game. Yes, we won the Grand Slam. We, we, we beat Ireland. But we used 36 players in that, in that whole tournament. And that was you know, 14 years ago. 36 players across yeah. five games uh, as it was then. So I wouldn't be surprised if that number is even higher for Ireland, for England in, in this tournament. But um, we still love it, even though uh, even though there's, that not every team is at full strength. And, and hopefully uh, it'll give us the opportunity to perhaps understand and get to know some players that we haven't yet seen. Well, when you look back on the Five Nations and the Six Nations that you were playing at the start of that, what are the memories that come back? Not of your time, but the times beforehand. Uh, just well, I love I love the tournament, the history, the heritage. I think it's um, I love the the that it celebrates difference. You know, rugby is about celebrating difference, um, but also being together as a as a group. I love the rivalries of of the not just the countries, but the rugby rivalries. You know, it's uh, it gets sort of played up into you know into national rivalries but actually it's I prefer to play it down into the real rugby rivalries each game is a very special occasion I love the the one-off um, kind of nature of the games that there's no kind of home and away or we don't get to play you next week if we don't quite do so well this week you know it's a it, it's an incredible one-off and and I love the just the occasions themselves you know the fact that they're Yes, the tournament has been tweaked over the years, but it's kind of more or less etched into everyone's sort of sporting diary throughout you know that that period of time, February, March, April, or February, March. This, the Five Nations, Six Nations, that's what it's about. Um, and it's tough, and it's hard to win. You know, um, it's it's not something that you take for granted, and and it is probably the greatest rugby tournament in the world. Do you have one memory from your youth? Of the tournament, yeah. Um, well, it's easy to remember the, the good times, isn't it? Really, um, and I, I probably I have my greatest memory as a fan of rugby. I just played for England at under eighteen group or under nineteen, I think it was, and uh, I then went to watch England against France at Twickenham, uh, and I was standing in the old West Stand. Uh, and I watched that wonderful try that Philippe Saint-André scored, the length of the field, and then England went on to win the game, 21-19 or whatever it was, they won the Grand Slam, but it was the old Twickenham, it was an incredible atmosphere, Brian Moore couldn't even hear, you know, couldn't even hear the calls when he was throwing in, which didn't seem to matter too much, <laughs> as you'll appreciate, it's just not easy, uh, but it was just a wonderful occasion as a fan, and I thought to myself, and I hadn't played for England at that point, and I watched that game live, and I watched France score that try from under, the, under their own posts. And I watched England go on to win the game. And I thought to myself, I, I want to be out there. That, that's when I really thought, actually, I really want to be out there now. Because uh, I just played for England the day before. And it was just, it was something magical. And actually that try that Sant'Andre scored was voted the, the try of the century by, by all the nations. Uh, because it was pretty special. And if we fast forward to this tournament that's coming up what's your prediction uh, it's, it's, it's going to be the closest six nations we've had for quite some time um, I, th I don't think England will win it um, well I, don't, I really don't think England will win it I think Ireland will win it I'm not saying that because I'm sat next to you or I'm in Dublin I, I'm saying that because uh, it's such a hard tournament to win and England have won it twice in a row Ireland won it twice in a row before them and Wales twice in a row before them and no team has won three Six Nations tournaments. We've talked about the injuries that England have. Yes, of course, they have strength in depth. They have a big pool of players, but they really do have big injuries to, to some key players. So uh, I think it'll be close. If you take Italy's results away from the tournament, and I don't wish to do that, but sometimes you have to, just because they've still got a wee bit to catch up, although Conor O'Shea will, will bridge that gap. There was only one away win in the whole tournament last year. 
and that was by England in Wales with a try in the last minute of the game. So winning away from home is at a premium. Um, England won the tournament last year by losing to Ireland. Uh, you know, my prediction this year is that Ireland will win the tournament and they may even lose to England. Uh, but I do think they'll end up as champions because right here, right now, they're playing the best rugby. They have everyone fit and fresh and uh, they just look in good shape to, to win the competition. Are you going to go to many of the games? Uh, I'm, uh, I am going to go to as many as I can. Uh, I'm certainly uh, going out to Rome with, uh, with, with ITV, which will be fantastic. Um, I was lucky enough to captain England against Italy in the first ever Six Nations game. And as someone whose father was there with all his Italian parents and my mother was there with all the English side, that was probably my, my, my greatest moment as an England player. But uh, So I'm back there in Rome. Um, I shall be... Uh, at Twickenham for the two England games against Wales and on St Patrick's Day. I mean, what a day that'll be. Hopefully it'll be something that might go some way towards deciding the tournament. But if I had to pick one game, that's the one I'm, I'm, I'm probably as more excited about. England at Twickenham against Ireland uh, on St Patrick's Day with it, with hopefully everything on the line. Well, I think we might try and nab you before that and have a little chat, but that'll be the next time we meet up. I think we might go mad on that one. So, Lawrence, thank you very, very much. Would he? Enjoy, thank you. Enjoy the Six Nations. I will.